Okay, are you ready for Bible 101? I can hear that enthusiasm. Okay, class, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, beginning with the 10th verse. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we have some pew Bibles. I understand we even have children's story Bibles, so good luck on that one. But we do have them scattered out. You might have to share. And the reason I'm asking you to actually pick them up, turn them uh, to the proper section, a couple of reasons, actually. One, just sort of get used to it in church, and uh, it's multi-sensory. Get a little bit better acquainted because, with the Bible because 2 Timothy is not easy to find. It's in the Old Testament. Just making sure you're paying attention here. Also, uh, you're going to hear Beth read from the New Revised Standard. If you brought your Bible from home, it might be a different translation. Good, because that sort of opens up maybe different meanings of words or verses. So a lot of reasons we're asking you to do that, especially throughout the month of July. Now, this particular passage, background you'll want to note is this. Paul, they believe it was Paul who wrote this, or disciples of Paul who wrote it, to a young man named Timothy who was a young leader in the early church. It is part of a group of writings called the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters where uh, Paul is trying to give instruction to the pastors or to the church leaders. The instruction that he gives young man Timothy, as you're going to hear now, truly is timeless and universal for the church. Hear now the words of Paul. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Hey, Dave. Mind if I grab hey, a chair? Hey, Brad. How are you? Sure. Hey. Have a seat. I see hey. you got the uniform memo. <clears throat> what? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> great sermon today, huh? Oh, yeah. It was a great sermon. You know, the, uh, the announcement about the uh, Disciple Bible Study class, I've thought about doing that, but uh, I don't know. I'm just not comfortable. I think I'd have to take uh, Bible study for dummies or something first. I'm just not that comfortable with the Bible. What are you talking about? You've got your Bible right there. You're always carrying that thing around. Yeah, I've got it, and I, I use it. I, I read it when we're asked to look up something in church or in Sunday school, but I've never really delved into it that much. How about you? Me? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've got it all right up here. Really? So I, I guess you've taken some Bible study courses then, huh? Oh, heck no. <laughs> I don't have time to show up for that stuff. Oh. Yeah, I tell you the truth, I really don't have time to show up for church every Sunday, but <laughs> got to come down then to keep up appearances. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, David, uh, I've got a mind like a steel sieve. Yeah, and all that stuff I learned in Sunday school, you know, picked up along the way on television, newspapers, the internet, mm -hmm. I figure it's all still there. And, well, over the years, I figure I pretty much got the whole Bible thing down pat, at least all the important stuff. 
Really? Yeah. I guess I never realized you were that biblically literate. <laughs> <laughs> well, not a problem, Dave. I don't like to advertise, you know. Kind of makes people feel intimidated. Hey, but um, I could help you with that if you want. You could? Yeah. Well, I just kind of give you an overview of the highlights. And that way, when you go into that Bible study, you won't feel like you're starting out on the bottom rung of the class ladder. Oh, sure. Okay. Let's see here. All right. <clears throat> Shoot. Okay. So now, you know, you got your first book of the Bible, mm -hmm. which is Guinness. <laughs> now, that's all about God creating the earth. And, well, you've read the Guinness Book of World Records, right? Yeah. All started with God. Oh, and then we move on to Adam and Eve. Now, you know, Eve is famous for the very first commandment when she told Adam to eat that apple. And you can see, David, from the beginning of time, women have been telling men what to do and getting them into trouble. <laughs> no wonder we don't want to ask for directions. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, oh, there was Noah who built the ark for God and, of course, his wife, Joan of Arc. Wait a minute. Uh, are you sure? Are you sure you got that right? Uh, I saw this movie about Joan of Arc a couple years ago, and there wasn't anything in it about Noah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you see, that Joan of Arc was named after Noah's wife. Ah. Okay. Mm. Okay. And then, okay. and then we get to Moses. Now, Moses mm -hmm. led the Hebrews to the Red Sea, mm -hmm. where they made unleavened bread, which is bread made without any ingredients. And then after that, the Egyptians drowned in the desert, and then Moses went up onto Mount Sinai for the Ten Amendments. Uh, amendments? Did you say amendments? Uh, yeah. Aren't those commandments? <laughs> well, they kind of started out as commandments, but now we pretty much think of them as amendments. <laughs> I can see that. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, Moses died before he reached his goal of Canada. So it was up to Joshua to lead the Hebrews in the Battle of Jericho. Jericho? Well, yeah, where do you think they got the name anyway? You know, strength in battle, walls falling down, people falling down if they don't get their iron. <laughs> get it? Yeah, got it. <clears throat> All right, let's see, where was I? Oh, oh, okay, so now there was David. Okay. So he was this little shepherd guy who lived in biblical times, mm -hmm. and he helped fight another tribe that lived in biblical yep. times known as the Finkelsteins. Finkelsteins? Are, are you sure? Are you sure you don't mean Philistines? No, I'm pretty certain it was Finkelsteins. Okay. Yeah. Now, you see, David worshiped the Lord, mm -hmm. but his king was Solomon. And get this, Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. Porcupines? Yeah, porcupines. I remember hearing that when I was in the second grade and thinking, wow, that place must have been overrun with porcupines if one guy had 700 of them. I mean, he must have used them in battle or something. You know, hey, Finkelstein, go long. <laughs> All right. Are you sure you didn't hear that wrong when you were a kid? I mean, since you'd never heard the word concubine, maybe you thought your Sunday school teacher said porcupine. <laughs> nah, burned in my brain. Uh-huh. Yep, I'll never forget it because, you know, later when I was a little older, I remember thinking, how could Solomon let everyone know that he had 300 wives when the Bible specifically says, thou shalt not admit adultery? Okay. So... Let's move on to the New Testament. Let's okay. do. So, you know all about Jesus' birth because mm -hmm. of Mary's immaculate contraption, oh, right? Oh, no, no. So, the people that followed the Lord were known as apostles, and their wives were called epistles. And one of those guys, St. Paul, he cavorted to Christianity, and he preached holy acrimony, which is another name for marriage. And, oh, speaking of marriage, you know, Christians today are told to only have one spouse, which we, of course, know as monotony. It's, it's monotony, uh, never mind. Speaking of spouses, I see mine over there. I'm going to have to run, Bradley. 
I appreciate all your, um, your help. <laughs> Not a problem, David. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, Brad, you, you actually did help me. I'm, I'm going to feel pretty good about taking that Bible study course now. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be starting on the bottom rung of the class ladder. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I could help, you know. That's you know, you, you might think about joining us, and uh, maybe you could pick up a few new things. Oh, no, I'm, I'm too busy. But, uh, you know, if you come across anyone else that needs a little tutoring on the side, yeah. be sure and send them to me. Remember, I've got it all right, right up here. here. <laughs> I'll be sure to do that, Bradley. Okay. Ten four, good buddy. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the bit for me. Lest you think that was an exaggeration, there was a study done uh, a while back, and let's see, 12% of the American population does think that Noah was married to Joan of Arc. <laughs> According to the same survey, less than half can name the first book of the Bible, and it's not Geritol. One-fourth of Americans do not know what is celebrated on Easter, and 60% cannot name half of the Ten Amendments. <laughs> so maybe it is good that we dig into the Bible here today, Bible 101, and it's going to be uh, maybe a refresher for some, and hmm, I didn't know that for others, but it's good to do this. It's good to uh, really dive in, and it's going to be powered by your questions. Last month, I asked in several blasts, please uh, submit your questions about the Bible, and that's what's going to drive today when we talk about general questions, next week when we talk about the Old Testament, then the following week with the New, and, fo and finally, the last one would be about tips on um, how to read the Bible and really get something out of it, let it change your life. And again, Disciple Bible and other Bible study resources are available in the back at the Faith Formation table. So, let's start. Bible 101, if you will. First question, when was the Bible written and how? And let me preface all these questions and my take on them at least by saying that there are a lot of differing opinions uh, about how to answer questions like that. A lot of different opinions and just, just know that. Um, and as your pastor, you trust me, so just remember that. <laughs> All right. When was it written and how? Earliest form of the Bible was not written. It was oral. Stories around the campfire and the, the tribes of the Hebrews. Then as they formed a nation, they needed to uh, write those stories down so they would never be lost. They were written starting around 900 to 1000 B.C. on parchment papyrus, early forms of paper. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew with some parts in Aramaic, a dialect of uh, Hebrew. New Testament, well, after the, the ending book of the Old Testament was either 200 or 400 B.C., according to who you ask. Early part of the New Testament was written around 50 A.D., and uh, the last book around 100, 125 A.D., written in Greek, the universal language of the world at that time. We go from when was it written and how to who wrote it. One word, men. That explains a lot. It was a patriarchal period. The men were the ones who were educated to write, and it's a great testimony to the Bible that you do have women as heroines uh, that run throughout the pages of the Bible, including a couple of books in the Old Testament named for women. Very good. The uh, Bible was written by priests, uh, leaders of the church in the New Testament, written by poets, written by prophets, written by uh, philosophers, if you will. You had people who were writing it to preserve tradition, to explain tradition, to preserve history, to philosophize about life. 
you name it. The common link in all of that was the fact that people were talking about how God relates to them. You have the Old Testament focused upon God making a covenant or a promise with the children of Israel to be um, their God and them to be God's people. And you have in the Old Testament Israel's covenantal relationship with God. That's all covered in the 39 books of the Old Testament. And of course, the New Testament uh, is dealing with God's revelation in the Word made flesh through Jesus the Christ. So that's who wrote it. Now we get into a little more difficult question. Who decided what in the world goes in it? For the Old Testament, throughout centuries, Jewish leaders, and remember, it wasn't just one place, but you had different areas of uh, Palestine where Judaism spread. You had uh, different councils, different meetings of uh, the priests and scholars and lawyers of Judaism. And so they would meet and they would talk about which should be in the canon, canon being spelled C-A-N-O-N, the, uh, the books or the list of books that would be considered authentic or inspired. By around the first century AD, the Jewish canon was set. Now, the New Testament canon was a little bit more difficult. You had uh, a lot of different uh, letters and different uh, uh, stories about Jesus circulating. Same method, though, you had early Christian leaders convening councils, meetings to decide, okay, which would be inspired, which do we accept as sacred? By around the end of the fourth century, after about 350 years or so, the New Testament took shape as we have it now with 27 books. But now you ask, well, how did they decide what's going to be official in the canon? Well, the early Christians more or less took what the uh, Old Testament was uh, as mandated by the Jewish scholars. As time went on, there was a break between Protestantism and Catholicism, with Protestants accepting the 39 books of the Old Testament, we have it, and Catholicism accepting those books and also what's called the Apocrypha, which is a very good word to use to impress people why I have read the Apocrypha. And those are the books that were written after the last book of the Old Testament up to around the time of Jesus' birth. And so that's accepted within the Catholic Bible. For the New Testament, it was pretty tricky because you had a lot of different writings, like I said, that were surfacing. So the early church leaders had to come up with some standards, and here are four of them. When they look at a certain book, they would ask, was the author an apostle or have a close connection with an apostle? That was important for deciding what's going to go into our New Testament. Two, was the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? Three, did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? And finally, did the book bear evidence of the high moral and spiritual values that would reflect a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of the works were left out, and so we have what's called the New Testament Apocrypha. Uh, some of the, the things that were left out are pretty close to the Gospels. Others are way out there, and you can understand why they weren't put in. Now, one question you all also asked was this, does the Bible contain inconsistencies, and is it reliable? Here's my take on that. Yes, yes to both of those questions. And actually, they're related. When you look at the Bible in the Old Testament, you see that there are differing views of creation, differing interpretations of some stories or some traditions, some laws. In the New Testament, you have different versions of different miracles, including the resurrection and teachings. And you know what? That's good. It's very, very good, because if everything were consistent, then you would think someone was up to something. Someone would have an agenda. But one of the beautiful things about the Bible is that as people related to God, they did not censor it. 
So what you have over a span of a thousand years, brutally honest uh, stories, honest uh, depictions of people relating to God and God to people. It is one of the most beautiful things in the world to consider that in the midst of things that you can get uh, hung up on, well, well, what happened here, what happened there? Number one, you forget that people are people, and if one event happened right now, we would have, what, 400 people with differing views. And when those views were uh, written down, they were not censored, so that everybody can start relating to what happened. And in the midst of it, what the greatest thing in the world is, that there are remarkable consistencies. Yeah, it's written in the span of a thousand years, but there are some pillars that do not change. And because they start in Genesis and are consistent through Revelation, you know that they are inspired. The consistencies are that God is good, God is just, God is loving, God has expectations, God forgives, and God offers life. And those are the six pillars you can take to the bank. They are solid, regardless of the ebbs and flows of culture and history. That sort of leads into, and I think this is one of the, the, the tips, because there's this strong consistency, Paul could write to Timothy that all Scripture is inspired. That's the capstone of what he said. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. And that word inspired that you see underlined, the Greek word for that appears only in this particular verse in the Bible and nowhere else. It's almost like God, that uh, Paul made up this word. The word is theonestos. Theonestos. Theo, God. Nestos, breathed. Where we get the word pneumatic, breathed. God breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it makes you think back to the, uh, one of the accounts of creation, where God forms Adam, man, from the dirt of the earth and breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life. And Paul is saying, when you open up the Scriptures, you feel God's breath, and God gives you new life as you breathe in through your nostrils this breath contained in those words. It's really a shame that the Bible has gotten a bum rap as if the Bible is irrelevant. No, the Bible is alive. But if you were to take uh, an arrogant spirit with you to these uh, pages, then nothing more than any other library book, black, uh, black print on white paper. But when you bring to this book your heart, your honesty, your questions, your curiosity, your hurt, your pain, your hopes, then suddenly this book, you almost sense another presence with you. And it is as if God's breath flows into you and you experience the presence of God. Now this ends Bible 101 but I want to move into communion by suggesting that what we're going to be doing in communion is a little different from what I just said about how to let the Bible breathe on you. Because you see, in communion, what we do in the, what's called the consecration, is that we really ask God's Spirit to be breathed into the bread and the cup. We're doing communion because the Bible tells us to. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He said that after, on that night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And likewise, after supper, the Bible says, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you for this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. This is how our liturgy for the Last Supper always begins. But we also ask God's Spirit
to be breathed into these elements with a prayer such as this. O Lord our God, you whose spirit moves as the wind, we do not know where it comes from, nor do we know where your spirit will blow next, but we have faith that just as you have inspired the word of Scripture, so now may you send your spirit into the bread and the cup, that as your people come before this table with the same spirit with which they open your word, with a spirit of humility and of questioning and of pain and of joy and of seeking, that they, just as they receive your spirit through the word, so may they now receive it through the bread and the cup. We ask this most humbly in the name of Jesus, who lived, died, and lives again for us. Amen.